Before we begin, a quick disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment and information purposes only. It should not be relied upon as a base for any investment decision. Nothing here is a solicitation or an offer to buy or sell any security. Either the host, guests, or clients of either may own securities discussed on this podcast. Uh, today, my guest is Malia Bengali. She runs MBB Corner. It's an active trading and investment recommendation newsletter focusing on commodities and commodity-related equities. She uses top-down macro and bottoms-up fundamental relative value analysis. Um, hi, Malia. Welcome. Thank you, Bram. Lovely to be on board. Thank you for your time. No, thank you for uh, coming on. Hey, I just introduced you and uh, told the listeners what you do. But um, you, you have really interesting background. You were a long short portfolio manager at Noble Energy. Uh, Noble Energy is uh, like a major Asian uh, trading group. Uh, recently got into some um, difficulties after you were gone. Um, I, I would say it's somewhat compared to, to Glencore, but maybe uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you've been also at uh, UBS and um, you started out at a volatility desk. And you've always been in um, energy or commodity related um, functions. Uh, could you maybe tell us about your career and um, how you developed your uh, skill set through um, those various functions or career? Absolutely. Um, so I started my career, you're absolutely right, on the volatility desk. I joined O'Connor. Uh, it's a small sort of operating shop back in Chicago, and we were then bought by uh, UPS at that time. So my, my career started with trading options on the CBOE, which is really great because that's where my technical background comes in. Uh, trading volatility is a great way to understand how the markets work. A lot of people today actually do not give enough importance to index op- options expiration, and I think that really moves the market quite a bit, um, and we'll get into that later on. But after two years, obviously, when I joined the desk in the late 90s, at that time, the whole black short formula arbitrage was pretty much done and dusted. I, I got to trade some of the legends, which is brilliant. So we learned how black shorts worked. But unfortunately, when we joined, everybody understood how options worked. Uh, a couple of years later, UBS spun up as a hedge fund. And that's when I got involved in London on the uh, long short macro desk. We traded a lot of different strategies from long short arbitrage, risk arbitrage, stat arb, uh, vol arb, and convertible arbitrage. So we were like a macro multi-asset shop. And I, that's when I really sort of, uh, my career took off. And I worked with two senior portfolio managers who then went on to run UBS O'Connor. And it was a great four years because you learned everything. After you become like the jack of all trades and you're very good at what you do, I sort of chose a skill set. And then my, my manager at that time shifted me towards energy because energy at that time was trading $12 a barrel. You know, oil was trading at $14, $12 a barrel. So it was very interesting. It was very boring. Nobody really looked at it. So I got involved there. And then I started working with a, a senior energy manager trading equity long short. Uh, long story short, I mean, from there, I saw sort of, after UBS went through structural changes, we all went our own way. I uh, had a great four year, eight year career at UBS. And then I moved to. Um, Gomez. Gomez hired me to run the equity long short. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I actually went to Millennium before I went to Gomez and they were like, great, you're, you're really good. You have a great track record. Why don't you run money for us? But I was really young at that time. I was only about 27 years old. So I, I was doing well, but I knew I could, have, I could be doing better. I just wasn't seasoned yet. Um, so when I was in Millennium for a short stint and I love that place, I think it's a great shop. Gomez Commodity got in touch with me and they said, listen, you know what you're doing the macro and the micro side? We are very good at commodities. And I thought to myself that if these guys manage 80% of the commodity market, if I can get intel- intelligence from them, how much better would I do my analysis? And I was purely on the equity side. And that's when my entire career changed and my whole world opened up because we were building models up from bottoms up on Exxon, BP, uh, US shale companies, but we were getting the intelligence from the commodity side. So imagine when you actually know the top-down driver of what the gold price will do, the silver price or gas and power, and then you build your models. Equity models are really easy to build. We can all build them. It's not about, about the equity. Most of the sell side guys are so late in terms of upgrading the numbers, downgrading the numbers. So we were going to try to get ahead of them, ahead of the cycle from physical market signals to sort of play the earning cycles. And that was the whole new different world. So I'm so glad I learned a lot from commodities of uh, Goldman and that's when I became a pure commodity specialist. So my background is very macro and I use my macro tools to really sort of zero in on my, on my fundamental ideas. And after Goldman's, I obviously went to Merrill's because I ran the desk at Merrill's and they wanted to build that. And after Merrill's, Noble Energy. The reason why I went to Noble Group is because at that time, as you know, the global financial crisis, a lot of the banks were taking their capital away. So we were all making money. But, you know, if you're making 20, 30, 50 million dollars, at that time, banks were losing a lot of money. So you were like, you know, prop was not allowed to be done. 
and all the physical hazards like Glencore, Traffic Dura, Noble, Mercuria, these were guys who were so physical heavy, but they had no idea how to weigh the equity. So they were like, hang on, this is a skill set we can completely match up. We have a lot of capital, come and build the business. So I went on to Noble Group and there were three of us. We started the ARC Asset Management Fund and we built the Commodity Fund and we did really, really well. But the thing I'd like to highlight is that most equity long shot guys who trade energy always look at bottoms up. And that's great because I think having a fundamental thesis is very important. But commodity markets have changed. Since 2004, when China came to the spectrum, we had a massive urbanization of commodities and you cannot look at commodities in isolation. So the old commodity guys who looked at physical markets in demand supply, you just can't isolate yourself and not look at macro. So you need this sort of hybrid person to look at macro, bottoms up and physical markets. And that's really where my career and my skill set has evolved over years. Um, and after, after Noble, of course, I decided that, uh, you know, this business is, there's so much to grow, but I don't want to be, I don't want to have uh, anyone hanging on my head in terms of regulatory or capital or, you know, risk limits, um, all that stuff, because, you know, end of the day, prop test capital is very, very, very tight. So I went my own way about five years ago and I started, I launched MB Commodity Corner, which is a consultant firm. I advise hedge funds how to manage money in commodities and equities, because these guys are great macro guys, but they don't understand the physical side. And also advise equity hedge funds how to manage the physical side because they have no idea. So you're going to have the trade on both sides mismatched. And that's really what MBCC does. Uh, I also have a fund that I've launched, uh, Seed Capital, Friends and Family. And that sort of has all my ideas uh, benchmarked to, to, um, to my calls. So that's really my career in a, in a, in a snapshot. Yeah, it's uh, su super cool. Um, and uh, a very exciting, you know, all, all those places where um, you, you've worked. And um, so, <clears throat> what? What if when I hear you um, speak about that? So you really use like um, like a lot of the com commodity information to to maybe do like a shorter term analysis, and then okay. the macro helps a lot with the longer term. Or how? So this is this is the backdrop. I will never take a view on my book just on the dollar or bond yields of credit because there are many guys out there ten times smarter than me doing macro. But I understand macro really really well. So what we do is we have a a, a three tier approach whereby we look at the macro. We have a view on where we think the cycle is going economically, uh, U.S., Europe, China, da da da, and then dollar. Once we get that framework sort of analyzed, we then look at physical markets. So we break every commodity down: oil, gas, uh, copper, aluminum, uh, silver, gold. We base our own demand supply models. Once we have a view of inventories, because the commodity markets, forgetting macro, it's all about inventories. So once we get a view as which markets will be tighter or, or looser going forward, we get a framework as to which commodity we like. And then once you get the commodity, you sort of filter down to all the equities, because I know all these companies for the last you know, 20 years, we'll be building models on them. And then you sort of isolate. The, re the way we sort of execute, for instance, oil is a great example. People have been calling oil is cheap for the last you know, five years. I mean, cheap yeah. can get cheap. This has been my slogan for the last, for all of this year. But if you look at just your equity valuation model, you'd be buying BP five years ago and completely losing out. So we look at triggers from when the macro aligns with the physical market in charge. When we get a signal saying that we think oil is tight or oil is getting really loose, we will then filter that view through the equity market. And that's why we hopefully hope that our fund stands out because our tactical timing on the long short time is a lot better. We're not a short-term trading shop. Like for instance, I, our investment trades go from one to six months. So usually a quarterly cycle. Three months is your perfect sweet spot in terms of a trading investment horizon because we're playing earning cycles. And the commodity markets has a one-year cycle, but it goes through seasonality. The oil market changes every six months. So we take that short-term view uh, to play those cycles. We're not day traders. I don't, we don't trade momentum, but obviously technical analysis is a big part of our entry and exit. So once we have a view on oil long or short, we'll use technical analysis to complement because we understand how these things work. But I would never start my investment decision based just on the macro, the technicals, if you know what I mean. The fundamentals have to line up and, and that's the, you know, the mother of all trades effectively get the timing right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fascinating. I'm starting to understand uh, where you're coming from. Um, and I kind of, I'm, I'm still curious to struggle with this myself. And um, how, how do you, um, um, get to your views now that you're no longer surrounded by um, experts on like every commodity that you can tap or colleagues uh, you can bounce ideas off or like um, uh, like at Noble you probably got a lot of like input from the physical side that really gives you insight that's just not available anymore to you um, I would guess and um, how did you how do you um, right how yeah. do I navigate 
that. So you're absolutely correct. I think the commodity market, because there are such few players involved, like, you know, for instance, in the core market, Goldman's was big, you know, uh, on the physical side, you know, you had Noble Group controlling the iron or steel market. So flow is very important. I think research over the last 10 years, and I hate to say it because of the, sh the shops I came from, they've gone more and more marginalized. I mean, names like Jeff Curry and some of the great Merrill Lynch guys, Bank of America guys, you know, re research was something that was very, very um, value added, uh, insightful. Now it's become more academic. So you don't actually need that research to really trigger the trade. In fact, on the contrary, I think research these days are probably too late to the to, to the to table. So when I read, let's say, a report right now on copper going to 8,000, I feel like saying, where were you the last three months when copper was trading at 6,000, right? So so that, that's not the problem. I think research is getting very marginalized now and we can get access to everything. You pay a subscription, you get access to that. So what you're missing actually is flow. You're absolutely right to contacts because I speak to all my shipping brokers, my physical guys, and these guys respect you because at the end of the day, they get information from you on the macro side. So you have some really strong relationships, which I have not lost. And these guys have left the industry. They've launched their own funds. I wouldn't say I'm missing out because all the market has changed. It's not about you know, who's dominating the, the institution flow. It's more about the physical market. So for instance, some of our trades, we might get the day on day trade, right? If you have a big order from Glencore or someone, but we will not get the bigger picture wrong. So in that case, I don't think I've actually lost out uh, because the, the traders have moved on, the, the game has changed. And then the house is actually, I think the research is very readily available for anyone who understands it. The main thing is interpreting all that data. So all the data is at hand on Twitter or Seeking Alpha or Bloomberg and Platts, which we subscribe to. But the thing is, what do you do with that data? And that's where your expertise comes in. And that's where we stand up because we've, we've done all that for the last 25 years. Yeah, and so all, I, yeah. you also mentioned before that you use a lot of like the company level data, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The conference calls, I go on conference, I meet all the CEO and the management. That doesn't change. That sort of due diligence on the equity side is paramount. You need to understand how the company grows, margins, VAC, cost of capital. That is essential. But like I said, these things will not tell you exactly when to buy or sell the stock. It'll tell you where the consensus is versus where the company is going. So it's just one piece of the puzzle. The main thing comes in from the physical side. Most companies when you speak to, even when you speak to Exxon and BP and these guys, do you think they'll tell you where oil price is going? They have no idea. They, they're thinking about the next 20 years. In fact, our job on the Gomez was actually advise them how to hedge their books. So we are more commercial than these guys are. So I, and, and most companies will tell you that we are not there to trade the next quarter. And they will get annoyed by hedge fund clients like us who would ask them questions about the earnings because they're not a quarterly cycle. They play the, the five, 10 year cycle. So the edge really is in our sort of read on what the physical market is doing and then following on the equity market following back of that. And the equity is driven by the commodity, not the other way around. Sure. Yeah. So, so um, this like I was trained as like a bottom up, uh, bottom up uh, value investor. So, and there the rule is like, you don't take a view on the commodity, you know, you just take the strip or, uh, or even right. spot. And uh, over time, um, I've sort of gravitated towards, well, supply is something I can look at. Like s s sometimes it, it looks pretty predictable. And then the demand side is still to me a huge question. Uh, do you feel that it's like easier to um, to like start to read supply or? Um... I think supply is easy one to navigate because you have all these incredible um, you know uh, agencies out there that do these things on a quarterly basis, yearly basis, IEA, EIA, you know, for copper, whatever have you. But it's that's not the difficult part of the puzzle. The puzzle is demand side because what we do is we actually run a model. So for instance, something like copper. Copper is called Dr. Copper for a reason, right? It's your gauge of economic health globally. So we actually run simulations based on our view. So we have a, a generic demand supply model, and then I'll simulate based on my view on 3.5% GDP, 3.75, 4% GDP, and I'll see how much that sort of deficit and surplus changes. So that simulation is very important for me to understand because I'll have a view on the dollar and I have a view on China and US, and I know where the street is at. So that mismatch tells me how tight the copper market can get. This is just, obviously, it's, it's not more than a science. But once you understand the sensitivity as to how tight the market is, it tells you which can rally the most. Because this is something you've done some my commodities. It's like, it's, it's an inventory game. If you have something for commodity today, no matter how much you need it, the price is going to go down because there's too much of it. And the prices go below zero, as we saw back in oil in April. Um, it's not like an equity. The equity market has a DC, have a flow of value, has assets. A commodity, if you don't need it, it's worthless. Vice versa, if a commodity you need, like you know, electricity or whatever, you pay infinity for it if, you, if there's a shortage. So this is very important to understand how tight the market is. And that's what we try to do. Yeah. 
And this has been one of the main reasons in terms of oil, like the oil market is very, very loose. So when you have these demand factors, even you need demand to move so much to get a dent in the inventories. And that's where you get your price sort of bands as to where the demand supply is. Right, yeah. So demand, demand, demand is the main mover and most people are too late to predict demand. For instance, right now you're seeing all these guys upgrading Q4 GDP from downgrading back in Q2, but this is all being priced in by the market. So I think these analysts, these guys who actually upgrade their demand numbers are too late to the game. You know, they, they're only regurgitating what's happened as opposed to what will happen. And then yeah. they use a late line. So if you, what happened last quarter is not going to happen next quarter. So your demand projections are all off, right? So you need to play with the supply side. Yeah, so, so you're already um, diving into it. Like, what are your views on uh, what the next 12 months or six months so look it's, like? So it's interesting because uh, for us, copper has been, is an interesting example, right? So copper has been your benchmark, Dr. Copper, your gauge of Chinese GDP and US GDP. But liquidity has something that triumphs fundamentals. And this is something like, you know, myself and a lot of industry specialists have probably uh, learned uh, in a harsh way in terms of how to understand where the market stands up. Because copper market is so finely balanced that and China is buying incredible amounts of copper right now. They're importing about 2 million tons, if not more. And they are, they've printed about you know, 30 billion this week, another 30 billion a couple of weeks ago. They're injecting liquidity. No matter what you, happens, they need to make their 7% GDP target for Q4 and they need to make, because Q1 was so bad. So when you have all that wall of money coming in, your demand supply model goes out the door. So liquidity is very, very important. And that's why we think right now, the, the you know, 2020, we've printed about $20 trillion in global central bank stimulus. And central banks are not easing up right now. They're going to be printing more, not less. So with that backdrop, there's only one way to go. Right now, we are stalling in Q4 in Q1 because of you know the world is not going to go back to normal for another six months. Vaccine permitting, best case scenario by next summer. That that's best case scenario. But either way, central banks can pump more and more money. So we are bullish from a liquidity perspective, even though the real economy has a lot of problems. But then again, markets do not trade with the economy. Markets trade on back of liquidity and drive fundamental drivers. And going back to the whole central bank argument, with all this extra money sloshing around, and there's no end in sight to how much debt they're going to raise, they need to raise more debt. They need to do another fiscal stimulus. That means commodities can just go higher. So when you look at your commodity selections, you know, gold, silver, copper, these are high in the pecking order. Then comes lower down oil because of the demand supply. So, and that's how we think about the growth. So we are very bullish on commodities. Um, we would be bearish if we have a tactical call. For instance, in oil, I would be bearish or bullish based on the cycle I'm in. But we are generally very bullish in commodities based on the inflation and the debt cycle bigger picture. Okay, so, um, yeah, it's clear what you're bullish on. But oil, um, I heard you hesitate. You're shorter term, you're more bearish or more careful? Right. So going back to the oil market. So the oil market is a seasonal market. In the summer, we have gasoline market that's very important. And in the wintertime, we have distilled heating oil. And people don't really understand this. Most of the people who trade on a generic basis, oil is not really the driver. It's the product that drive the oil. So back in September, October, when the gasoline season ended, we were getting a bit bullish because when oil is trading at $35, $37 a barrel, when you have a Q4 winter hemisphere demand season, there's a massive uptake, right? This is before the lockdown started in Europe and the U.S., there was a chance where Q4 was going to get really tight and the market with the physical market looked like the risk reward was down 5%, up 20%. So we were tactically long oil back in September as per um, our notes and recommendations because it made sense. It, the investment proposition was a lot more attractive then than it was right now. Then obviously luck happened. We got the vaccine news and everything sort of happened really fast in three weeks. Oil rallied 28% in a matter of three weeks. But then again, that's a bit too soon too far. Right, because on a one year view, we are very bullish in oil, thinking by next year we can get to maybe 50 or 55, but that's not going to happen in three weeks because we still have a lot of inventories, we still have demand that's stalling in jet fuel. We do not have a, people are not going to feel safe to travel again. Q1 is probably as bad as Q4 until probably April. So, based on the demand supply, we think oil near term has done too much. And I think that's what the market's going to, because the, the inventories have to catch up with oil. So, we were bullish, but it happened to work in three weeks. So, we got out and we have flat oil. And I think for choice, you can probably be short oil. I think it's dead money right now. But in the longer term construct, there are a few things we're keeping an eye out on demand. China, Chinese Indian demand is very strong. That's offsetting the slowdown in US and Europe. If the easing of the travel restrictions happen and we get a, a people start traveling and there's more vaccinations, we can get a massive surge in Q1. So we're monitoring to see how the demand rate plays out, but the imagery size looks very ample right now. So honestly, if I had 
ample amounts of capital, I'll probably put it away, but it's going to do nothing for another three or four months. And we are more tactical with that. I'd rather put my money into something that has more juice near term. So from that point of view, we are more sort of cautious and bearish in oil because a little bit too much too soon. And then you have the OPEC meeting right now, which I, you can tell that they are in a bit of a dilemma right now. Um, you know, we still have 7.7 .7 million barrels per day out of the market. What people don't understand is that oil is not like copper. There is a lot of oil around. It just needs to be switched on like that. So if OPEC starts to taps right now, oil price will probably be back down in mid thirties easily, but they're holding because they're trying to buy time. They're hoping that demand picks up fast enough so that when they switch the taps on, that demand soaks up the supply. So we're in this sort of inventory period where oil market's not tight. It can get tight. If we get to a point where U.S. shield cannot go back to 30 million barrels per day, which it probably wouldn't. The U.S. shield industry has has gone through a paradigm shift. We will never go back to the highs because the players are going bankrupt. They will not be getting the credit, the cash to actually produce. So I think the US has sort of lost permanently 2 million barrels of oil a day, but then you have OPEC and Russia and these guys obviously increasing more. But that sort of is, like I said, we still have this supply signal out of the market. And in Q1, when that comes back, oil price will be capped and then slowly can move higher. But there's so many moving parts right now that we'd rather see how it evolves. But OPEC will try its best to get an extension of the rollover cuts because if not, oil price is going to fall. So the risk reward today is either oil caps or goes lower or it really falls down. So why would you own oil right now? So you kind of expect Saudi Arabia wants an extension? And, uh, Absolutely. Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, even Russia, all these guys, this is a bit contentious, but most of the Middle Eastern producers, they need oil at least $65 a barrel or higher. I mean, your Saudi government budget deficit spending, they need it probably 85 to make money, not because of the cost of oil. The cost of oil is really mm -hmm. low between and dollars a barrel. They've had such spending plans that need oil to go back to 85 to start being positive. So they have a pressure of getting oil higher. The sweet spot for most people is probably 55. That's when they get start getting comfortable. Russia is happy producing with oil at 50 to 55 because their cost production is low and their spending plans are not as bad as, as with the Middle Eastern guys. So these guys looking at higher prices. This is the point of contention because why should they keep holding production back when all U.S. shale and all the other guys are enjoying higher prices? And there's this lack of sort of cohesion. Um, and Saudi is doing a very good job in keeping the members contained, but you have a lot of friction from Iraq is now over producing 600,000 barrels a day. You have Russia also producing over producing 500,000 barrels a day, but you can't keep these guys back down. They want to make sell as much oil to make money to pay for their sort of each government plan. So this OPEC policy is going to probably be rolled over because it makes sense for everybody, but there's still a lot of cheating. And that's why I think compliance is very important to track. Um, and could you actually tell Russia not to oil produce 500,000 barrels a day? It's very hard. Uh, so that is, that's the problem with oil price. You need to watch all these dynamics to understand who's producing, what is their sort of, you know, the point at which they sort of peak and they need to produce more uh, and the demand of course factor as well, very important. Well, and are you tracking that or did you gain insight over time, like uh, how compliance tends to work out? Or, yeah, uh... based on tracking these meetings for the last 20 years, it's not about what they say, it's about what they don't say. And it's just um, you know, based on industry contacts and speaking to the ministers, you get a feel for what they're thinking and what their stress points are. And even though you, never, you can never have a verbal confirmation, you know what drives their decisions. So most of the time when you read these things on Bloomberg or something, it's really not what they're thinking. It's, it's a lot more complicated. Uh, geopolitical tensions. I mean, you know, the whole sort of thing that happened back in April. I think it's important to understand all from that perspective. Uh, and that sort of gives you a good framework to understand what they're doing and when, they, when it's really the choking point and when there's really the time for them to start producing. And that's important. So we are going for the fact that I think they'll probably extend the cuts because it'll be healthy for all the members rather than see another oil price collapse for another three or four months. They're hoping that by Q1 demand in the world's going to normalize. So then the price will slowly gradually move higher. For instance, in November and December, they did not expect the extra lockdowns in Europe and US. So they were hoping to actually roll back in December, but they've extended it. So they're just buying time effectively. All right. Hey, and um, I think you're like, um, you're real flexible and your views on, uh, on oil, I think, and you'll pivot real quickly. Uh, maybe gold is a little bit, um, it's a middle, little bit more tied to monetary policy, I would guess. Right. Um, you have a longer term view on that or? Um... Well, gold and silver, for instance, um, is a lot more macro oriented. Okay, so the gold market, I mean, you can build a demand supply model of gold, but anyone will tell you that gold doesn't really move on demand supply. So it's like a commodity, but it's much more for macro as a tool. So you need to sort of think a little bit outside the box. What really drives gold? And by gold, I mean silver as well. It's real yields. This is the most important relationship that most people need to look at and most people probably don't. They look at gold and the dollar, which also is a very good relationship. As real yields go down, gold goes higher. 
and real yields are defined by your gross yields less the cost of inflation or the CPI. So if inflation moves higher and your yields are capped, your real yields go down and gold goes higher. And that's where we are right now in the market. There's a massive disconnect. People like us who are cross asset traders, we look for opportunities where things diverge because that happens once or twice a year. And that's pure alpha. That's just pure free money trade to put on right now. Like just the last few days, I've talked about how you have this disconnect where real yields have actually moved lower and gold actually has gone down, but the dollar has gone down too. So since September, gold is down 10%. The dollar is making new lows right now and real yields are down. Something's not adding up. So as a macro trader, you want to jump on that bandwagon and get as long gold as you can possible from a demand supply point of view, but also from a macro point of view. So you start to get both signals aligning up. Now, the problem with gold and silver right now is that people are getting so excited about cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, they start taking money out of one point to the other. But my logic is, our logic has been that these are two separate assets with two different types of momentum and two different demand supply models. The crypto, the Bitcoin market has, you know, seen, you know, you only have 21 million Bitcoins and that's halving every four years. And we're coming from a, a zero to a 350 billion market cap. You cannot compare gold to Bitcoin. But the theme behind fiat currency debasement and more debt and more debt, that's not going away. So why choose one versus the other? It's about risk management. If you buy Bitcoin, you can make 200%. But if you buy gold, you can make safely 20, 30, 40%. It's about risk management. It's not an either or call. But I think that's the reason why gold is playing where it is. But from a macro point of view, we are very bullish in gold and very bullish in silver, uh, more than gold. On the, and that's a much more three to six month, probably one year view, because these things trade in longer cycles. Yeah, and um, oh, well, I, I've got multiple questions for you, but you said so many interesting things. So silver, uh, first, because you t talked about it last, um, that has an industrial component. And with, well, from like a um, person who doesn't know a lot about it, I think it goes into semiconductors right. who get an AI boost and it goes into solar um, stuff and everybody wants solar. Right. Um, so that's big t um, tailwind. Yeah. And, it and then it's like the Ethereum to, the, to gold. Correct. Very well um, said. Is, are um, those things go into your view or some, some more? I think the, on the physical supply, yes, you have all those sort of factors where if you look at mind supply versus physical demand supply, you can build a very stable model to demand supply, right. right? But that, I don't think alone is going to answer the questions to why to buy silver today. But for instance, before the, the, the run-up we had this year, silver had been quite bearish for the last five years. So the, the question is, what's the new marginal driver? The new marginal driver is not that. It's actually the fact that the physical market of silver is trading at a... Um, 30% plus premium to actual physical coins are trading at a premium to the paper market. So you have this massive disconnect where if you believe in inflation, our generation has not seen inflation until probably the 1970s, right? That was the last time we saw real inflation. So yeah. if you actually believe in inflation, which we have never, most traders don't speak of inflation because they've seen deflation, you need to own hard assets. So forgetting the fundamental demand supply silver model, which is quite easy to analyze and, 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 and trade, it's this new driver, which is the inflation assets that you need to hold hard physical assets in a currency in the world where governments are just debasing. And the reason why they're debasing the fiat currency is because there is no way to get out of this debt bubble they've built. There is no way out. The only way is to have the great reset, which no central bank in the world would have the guts to actually do that, which means inflate the problem more to you deflate the problem away, right? Inflate it away effectively. And that's really the premise behind gold, oh, sorry, gold and silver. And if you look at the physical market from its generic use, which is very, very strong, you still have this added layer of people holding from a retail point of view. And I think that's, that, that's the reason why we're so bullish because there is a shortage of coins. Uh, and you can see that in the, in the physical market. No, I, uh, um, I, I totally agree with um, that assessment. I think uh, inflation uh, assets are super interesting because they're also cheap. Like uh, deflation assets have become pretty expensive and uh, inflation is not the case. So that's interesting. You can even buy companies that are great in inflation times and they're not that cheap. So uh, that gets me um, uh, a few more things. Like you're interested in cryptocurrencies. Did that start because you noticed that they are like taking share from gold? Um, it's my, okay, so I will not profess to be a Bitcoin expert. Uh, I, I dabble in that for my personal account, not for the fund because it's too volatile. My mind is not to, to dabble in such high-risk instruments, but I'd like to understand Bitcoin because it was about a year ago where I was, I've been quite agnostic about Bitcoin. But from the whole fiat currency macro theme, I think it's important because you have a new asset class that's very nascent and I think it's growing. So we actually believe in this becoming a legitimate asset class and central bank digital currencies 
is not just a, a story. It's, it's an actual fact that's going to happen in the next year. I mean, you've seen uh, pilot test programs in China and you've seen the U.S. talk about it, uh, Saudi Arabia and Middle East are talking about it. So it's going to happen. So when you sort of think about central bank digital currencies, which is helicopter money effectively, and that's the way the governments are moving, you have to look at Bitcoin. Even if you're not trading it, it's interesting because now hedge funds are getting more than Bitcoin. So yes, there's some flow one out of the other, like I said, but we don't look at an either or, but we need to understand that if you believe in this fiat currency debasement theme, you have to look at cryptocurrencies. And I think more and more players are getting involved. And this is this time, it's unlike 2017, where it was just your mom and pop buying your Bitcoin, right? There's a bunch of traders coming to you saying, oh my God, I'm punting in Bitcoin. Now you have real institution guys looking at Bitcoin. So it's getting a bit more sophisticated, but this is a very early market. I mean, we are nowhere near 350 to 400 billion. So you can imagine how much more it has to go. Will we get there? I, I'm not that crazy and bullish. Like I said, I'm not an expert. I can understand that we can get there because this is a new concept, but it's important to, and that's why I started taking a look at it because it helped me understand gold and silver a lot better. So my main view is to trade my generic commodities, but if I don't understand what's happening in Bitcoin and gold, I won't understand the flow to trade my gold and silver. And that's what happened with the discount in the last few weeks is because people are rushing into Bitcoin, retail traders, institutional traders out of gold because gold's boring. The amount of calls I've gotten for my clients in the last few days are like, why are you wasting your time early here? Gold is so boring. And like, gold may be boring, but I'd rather park half a billion of my fund in gold to make 20% than to put you know, 10 million to Bitcoin to hope to make 30 million. So it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting topic, but that's why I started taking a look at it to understand what it means for gold and silver and the dislocations. Yeah, that's, uh, it's crazy how fast that sentiment uh, can turn on gold. It was real hot in the uh, first half of the year. Yeah. Um, oh. yeah, because have been they've been dilly dallying right we haven't got a fiscal stimulus for the last three months with the u.s elections and you know they, they talked about a two and a half trillion dollar stimulus now we probably won't have until early next year market is go really it's gold and silver with more money being printed but they're not thinking about what's happening to the fed's balance sheet the fed's still buying 120 billion dollars of, of bonds every month and they've actually the balance sheet's going up so even if they don't announce a fiscal stimulus you still have a lot of money being printed and debt in behind the scenes and just yesterday the fed announced an extension of their ppe facilities so we are going through a path of more not less but since we haven't seen an actual fiscal bill people have been waiting on the sidelines to buy gold and silver for the next leg but it's it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when is how we see it and we could probably get one probably by the year end it's quite possible uh you mean another bill or uh the, the same fiscal bill i mean mcconnell made comments about it yesterday about how they should probably get some sort of COVID aid relief i mean if you look at the, the images in the u.s the job market is in dire straits right now people are running out of their facilities to pay their bills mortgages the u.s economy needs some assistance they need a COVID relief bill and the fiscal stimulus is going to happen it should happen sooner than later we're being sort of dogged by politics and people playing the Republican Party versus the Democratic Party, but it will happen. The U.S. economy, if they don't pass the bill right now, there's a serious chance of a double dip recession in the U.S. And this recovery will be, you know, met by a complete failure. And so I think that's going to happen. And I think people are waiting for that to happen to then buy gold and silver, whereas we think that it, it's already happening in sort of mild doses and that trend does not really change. Uh, yes. about gold and silver here. Yeah, so it's also your sense that there's some anticipation of something like that happening fairly soon. Correct. So interesting. Correct. And then uh, maybe what's, um, how do you express all these traits? Like if you had to express them or you could express them in your favorite way, um, what do you like to do? Sure. So we can actually trade the commodity futures. So the best way to, as one of my managers also told me, he's like, Malihead, do not overcomplicate a view. If you have a view, just trade the commodity. And I think that's the best way to play. So we actually trade the actual futures in gold and silver. They're very liquid. Uh, they have, you know, the great track record. Uh, volatility is not an issue. But then we also take a look at some of the equities because the equities that we look at, uh, some of the silver junior miners, uh, some of the large cap silver mining companies, Mining companies are a bit more complex, so we spend a lot of time developing models because it's not like an oil company or copper company where the margins are a lot higher. It's a very intensive, very capital intensive business. So when you look at a top line silver projection or gold projection, your bottom line varies a lot because the costs of the business are very high. So you may get the silver call right, but you pick a company that has massive debt or does not is operationally inefficient. So you have to do a lot of work to pick the right company. So we sort of choose a basket of, let's say, five companies that we think are sort of large to mid cap where we can understand the cycle. We don't trade really small cap stocks because uh, like I said, you know, I'm not a geologist by background. So if I'm being a macro theme, I want to represent that view to, in the most cleanest, transparent way possible. So once you pick a company that has, you know, on our benchmark, we have four or five different hurdle rates, good cash flow, low debt, good operation efficiency, uh, margin exposure and capture rates. Once you build sort of a good thesis, we sort of add them to our portfolio to play the silver view via equities and commodities. 
And sometimes we run correlations and we, my background with Goldman's has been, we ran a lot of cross asset model correlations and whether or not people like to admit it, there is a cross asset arbitrage opportunity, not in everything, but I've done these models over a thousand companies. They're probably 20 and 25 companies where the, the arbitrage is beautiful. It's just the, 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 the correlations are perfect. So there is a time where we see the commodity outperform the equity. So we'll get out of one into the other or we'll switch back in. So our fund does dynamically get in and out. For instance, the oil price is a great example. Back in uh, in the during the November election and just the recent rally, the equities were trading at a 20% discount to the back end curves, the really leveraged ones. And then as the oil price rallied, the equities went 10% above. So that was a trigger to get out of the oil stocks and saying, you know, guys, this is getting a bit too ahead. If you really abolish oil, buy the oil curve rather than buy the equities. So having that sort of approach where you maximize your alpha trading out of each instrument just sort of adds to your view. Uh, and that's how we reflect our view on, on the commodity. Cool. And um, do you like use an overlay that you'll use like the better operators out of a set of liquid companies or? Um, yes. Yeah. We use uh, operators that are, uh, like I said, clean balance sheets, good management, high cash flow, uh, good quarterly cycles. Um, liquidity is very important for us because obviously if you're trading a large cap company, we need to understand that liquidity is important. So all the sort of usual things and not, it's not rocket science, but once you have a view, we want to represent that through the, in the cleanest way possible. Uh, and I think sometimes the equities, for instance, if silver price goes from, we think we silver can go to probably north of 30 or even 40 possibly, right? So if you think that much leverage can happen in silver, you can imagine the equities, some of the, some of the large to mid cap can go up to probably uh, double that even yeah. effectively. And I think that's the options that we have, but it's all about risk management and sizing your positions. You have to manage them so you can manage the beta on your fund, of course. Sure. Hey, now maybe if you, if we, uh, if you're comfortable with that, maybe you can go one layer deeper and like, uh, what are like your five favorite uh, positions or uh, I don't know, you can pick some time okay. frames, different time frames. So. Okay, well, some uh, a great ETF, like a lot of my clients actually some of them trade ETF. So if you look at SILJ, it's a Silver Junior Minoring Index. Uh, it's a great way to play the basket. Whereas if you are a high net worth client and you don't want to do the work and do the analysis, just buy the ETF and you start to trade the cycle. So that's really good. And most of them actually prefer doing that because it's cleaner for them. Then you have your first Majestic, you have Pan American Silver, Wheat and, wheat and, wheat and Precious Metals. These are great companies that we love. Uh, we actually know the companies, but we also have the model built on them. We also trade the ETFs as well. But these are just a few examples. Uh, they're very, very large and the margins are very good. Uh, then you can go very, very low down, but we won't go down a small cap space. Um, but, but I, think I mean, they're, they're large silver miners, but f I think for other companies that you trade in, they're still uh, real small they, companies. Still small. They are still very small. You're absolutely right. You can't compare an Exxon or a BP or even like an Amazon to these companies. So in the silver space, they're quite large, but yeah. the volatility and the market cap is still quite uh, volatile. You are absolutely yeah. right. Maybe a Wheaton uh, that will get a good capitalization as a streamer. I love those. Yep. Awesome companies. Um, yeah, they're all uh, great companies that you mentioned. Uh, love those. Uh, well, so, just play the ETF. You know, you have such great ETF companies, even in copper, COPX, yeah. SILJ. That's a clean way for poor guys, especially the high net worth clients, to get involved. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's um, that's easier. True. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's a great one. And uh, are you looking at that for like three months or six months or twelve months or the six month plus view? At yeah. least, um, for instance, okay. we sometimes in our fund we get involved. So we get involved a bit early sometimes because our my our call NBCC is to see what's going to happen as opposed to what's already happened. That's how we sort of set ourselves apart. Because as you know, being in the buy side for many many years, you know your sell side is great at calling shots after something has happened as opposed to before. So when you really need an analysis, you pick up the phone and when when stuff is down twenty percent in your face, no one's going to tell you, hey, buy now. But it's rallied it, you know, and, and we hate that. So at FBCC, we try to make a call before it happens. So typically, we are probably three or four weeks ahead. And that's fine because we use that time to average into the right price. So when people are getting out, it's usually when we're getting in. And then we run that view for three to six months. It, it is dynamic because obviously things can change. Uh, the, the pandemic, uh, liquidity, central banks, we're monitoring all the sort of macro triggers. But generally, this theme is a lot longer. And, and the next rally that happens will be a lot stronger because the fundamental, the secular theme has not changed. You know, people, you know, another topic we've been talking about is, is asset allocation. People are so used to trading 60-40 bond equity portfolio, but that only works because in the last 10 years, we've been in deflation. So bonds and equities have sort of worked really well together. But if you're in an inflation cycle, bonds are going to be falling as equities fall. So you don't have that perfect hedge. So the new paradigm, the new world order is to have some portion of gold, silver, and commodities in your portfolio, as well as equities, as well as volatility and some sort of bonds, right? And I think that's important for, from a secular perspective. No, I, I completely agree with that uh, idea, but um, I'm so curious, 
uh, are you finding like a lot of reception for that with like your larger clients or um, is that idea percolating through the industry? In terms of the portfolio asset allocation as opposed to the Well, I mean, there, there have been periods in history that it was completely normal for funds to have like a 5-10% allocation to precious metals, but um, that, that's so ancient it history. It takes a bit of it takes a bit of an education process because most of them are so used to you know you have financial advisors and institutions pushing the 60 40 but what we do is we run charts for them going back 30 years back in the 70s back in the 80s and we still run scenarios for saying look if you have inflation going to two and a half three percent and we will get there this is this time is so different we've printed three and a half trillion in less than six months we are going to get and we all seeing inflation around the world so if you get inflation there's no way but to see bonds and equities that 60 40 model will break up so i think once you show that to clients and be in a new paradigm the last 10 years will not be seen in the next 10 years they are waking up to that some of them are a bit slow but for instance are, are, are you know some of the, the people who we manage money for are like this completely makes sense and some of the most sophisticated ones have already gone board with the plan um and i mean the, the big other debate is owning u.s bonds would you own u.s 10-year bonds at a yield of 0.8 percent sure you could probably make money going down to maybe 0.2 maybe zero percent will they go negative we don't think so there's a little bit of alpha owning bonds but the bond market is dead the fed is on a complete yield of control path so this is dead money as we're concerned so why put your money in the u.s bond market where to make that of 80 basis points versus, you know, it can actually go up a lot higher. In this inflation, we can go up to two, two and a half percent. Not right now. The Fed's going to control the curve, and I think the bond market's dead in terms of getting signals. So we're not a big fan of bonds anywhere, and there's so much negative yielding bonds. I think if you want some sort of bond like exposure, you can buy convertible bonds of like large cap companies to get some decent exposure. But we think the the juice in the next few years will be commodities, and this is the most unloved sector, most misunderstood sector in the market. Uh, most people today don't even know how to play commodities. They keep asking about what's the ticker, what's the curve. They buy ETFs. And I think ETFs are the worst way to play the actual commodity because the curve dynamics are very different, as you very well know, contango and backwardation. I still remember this call I got from a client many, many years ago. Oil is up, you know, 50%. The ETF is down 20%. Why, why am I down? And, and that's really the, the education behind commodities. I think commodities are probably the most least understood asset class out there. So there's a lot of arbitrage, a lot of opportunity to educate people. And it's been so lost and forgotten for the last five years that I think the next five years will be very exciting, but most of the players are not around. And, uh, and I think that's really exciting to be in a part of this right now. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's real true uh, uh, that ETFs are hard to trade commodities in. Uh, I got a lot of calls in March and uh, somebody wanted to buy like the USO, which was a very popular uh, trade with um, new, new traders. And um, yeah, said that's not a great idea but uh well um, in hindsight they actually didn't change the composition they would have done really well right now but they changed and sort of made it more defensive and now they sort of missed the rally so it is hard you need to track the curve and the oil curve changes all the time i mean people like us we, we play the physical market the front back spreads all the time so it's very hard for the equity etf guys to really sort of stay on top of it if you just trade the oil futures and do the role that's very much yeah. better I do sometimes short the ETFs. And um, do, did you think, because you, you don't like the bonds, um, I've got sort of, um, I've got a mix of like longs credit and shorts credit and uh, some short bonds and a little bit of long bonds. Um, so, so I've got a mix going on. Are you doing anything like that or? Um, yeah. So we are a, a long shot macro commodity, long shot shop. So we'll trade the um, FX, commodities and equities. Those are pretty much the three instruments we trade. Uh, right. Like MBCC advises clients on how to manage their portfolio. So we'll advise them on bonds and stuff. But for the fund itself, for MBCC, we actually just trade purely the commodities and equities uh, as that's our edge and that's our track record. And um, yeah. Right, yeah, it's cool. Um, and then uh, maybe we could talk a little bit more about copper because I'm real fascinated with uh, copper. I think that's got like a great long-term setup with the whole, uh, yeah, I think you, you, we're from Europe and um, the whole electric vehicle um, energy transition, it's, it's, you can't escape it here. It is. Um, if so, so copper actually, you know, Long in the last 10 years uh, before this year, couple has thought about, okay, it's the best proxy for Chinese economic GDP growth, right? So I've did a demand supply analysis. Yeah. Copper market has been a tight, tight supply because the last five or 10 years, you have not seen mining companies invest for new copper mines. And we still have the same large copper pits, but we don't have new coming up on stream. So what happened was copper is now seen as this sort of sustainable play. And that's a big theme in markets, right? It's got this sort of electric vehicle angle, which obviously helps the batteries and copper is very important. And we believe in that. 
But there's something else that's changed as well this year is infrastructure. You know, so when, mm-hmm. when countries like China has always been a infrastructure led economy, that's how they did the massive urbanization back in the early 2000s. Yeah, and they're then, like over 50% of world consumption, right? It's absolutely, huge. Yeah. Exactly. So, so when, so, but that's how they grew in 2000 to 2008 and 10. But after that, the whole premise was to become a consumer led economy as opposed to an infrastructure led, infrastructure led economy. They've tried to delever shadow banking towards social financing. So this year it's a bit different because the, the impact the COVID had on the economic growth, they have boosted so much stimulus to infrastructure again. And this is against what China had been doing the last four years. The whole premise was to get less leverage and, and sort of come back to normal. But this year is an anomaly. So when you have a, a, a country like China boosting cement, steel, iron ore, and construction, that obviously is added to the copper story. So coming in the beginning of this year, you had a copper market that was about probably 300,000 tons surplus to begin with. And on demand supply, if you saw, saw the COVID pandemic coming, you think copper will crash. But copper market crashed. And for the first month in June and July, we were thinking something is not adding up. The copper market should be trading a lot lower than where it is because if every single commodity in oil is down, why is copper trading up the way it is? And it was, and that's when we had sort of a paradigm shift or sort of a rude awakening because the infrastructure program is the best way to get your GDP back up to 7%, right? You boost spending on infrastructure and the copper market now has come from a surplus to a deficit of 700,000 tons effectively, depending on what your demand assumptions are. And that's not stopping anytime soon. So you need to rethink copper about just being a proxy for global economic growth and think about the micro, which is you know infrastructure. Even Europe is talking about recovery. We've gone talk about more infrastructure in Europe, uh, building roads. The US wants to do a massive infrastructure spend as well because it's the best way to create jobs uh, get the economy boosted and get the economy to start speeding up. And if you have that influx of fast projects, infrastructure, copper is your, the first beneficiary. And then if you're a mining company, you know, you have to be incentivized to produce or look for more copper. Uh, since copper has been trading around three to $6,000 a ton for the last few years, most mining companies have not really invested in new capital because your IRRs need to be 15 to 20% on a long-term basis. So now we could be in a scenario back like we had in back in 2000 where copper pricing goes so high that it has to go to a point where mining companies get incentivized to start investing in new projects, uh, finding new deposits, uh, buying projects, right? And, and sort of taking more or copper off the ground. And I think that's a, a long cycle of life because it doesn't really happen like oil today or tomorrow. This takes three to five years to do. And this is where I think the market can get really sort of back, um, back footed on copper because copper, if, if China keeps stimulating the way they are and the, the world does as well, copper prices will keep going higher and higher and higher. And we know the dollar is actually going to be falling on back of more debt. So you have the macro and the micro really combining on back of copper. The minute um, we see China holding back on the stimulus spending, which I think at some point probably next year they have to do, that we'll, we'll sort of you know, cross that bridge when we get there, then we can sort of take a view as to what the copper price does. But in the near term, copper is going to keep going higher and higher and higher. It, it's a very tight market. Yeah, and then there's like a little bit of um, a China-Australia tension going on. I don't know if you... Uh, <clears throat> and there's now like 80 bulker, bulkers, that, those are like the commodity ships for people to know, uh, lying around China and they're not getting entry if they're from Australia. And they don't, don't contain copper at this moment. Uh, I think it's mostly coal, if I'm... Coal, iron ore, yes. Oh. Um, and I think they're trying to um, go hold the shipments. So Brazil is actually trading more shipments to China, but Australia is a big market. And the Australian market's crumbling right now because they, that's a big uh, customer of theirs. Yeah. Right. And I've been uh, real interested, for, like, how many ships does it take out of the bulker fleet because it affects, like, uh, the, um, the shippers, which are smaller companies. Um, and I don't think it does too much yet, maybe a little bit, but get, what if like, uh, China gets aggressive on the copper front? Um, do you think because, um, you know, Australia could ship to other places, but it, um, it complicates everything a lot. It does. That's a whole shipping angle. And I, I would not profess to be shipping, but there are games you can play on trade routes and everything. But from a copper perspective, if you took a, Take a look at global copper warehouse stocks. You have your COMEX, you have your you know, Chinese and your London Stock Exchange. Your global copper stocks have been declining quite hard. And I think if you look at the global picture, uh, you can argue that, yes, this can get quite aggressive. And China has been very smart about uh, importing and restocking right now when prices are low before the rest of the world does. So that it could be a bigger issue. At some point, it can also get so high. I mean, we were at 10,000 back in 2008, if I remember correctly. So it's not far away. It's quite possible. Uh, yeah, and, and nation is a concern as well. But yes, like if this thing stays as tight and we don't get mined copper coming out, 
uh, next year, for instance, we also had a lot of supply strikes this year. Copper market is, is a market where every year you come in, you have, let's say, 3.5% average supply growth, but then you have mines in Chile and Brazil, and you have these uh, strikes and labor negotiations, then you obviously get delays. And this year, we've seen a lot of delays uh, in actual copper. So we can sort of offset that next year. So you have to adjust for that, uh, and that does move quite, supply quite a bit, but demand is, the, is your big picture, it is very important. Liquidity is very important. Cool. And then uh, like things like India, uh, it's like a while, maybe a, a few years away, or um, would you agree? Or um, uh, is that why it's not really in your view? Because it's a huge country and it can still use a lot of copper? Absolutely. I, we don't trade um, the Asia side, but yes, we take a look at the demand supply factors and as well, it can sort of come to play. But right now, I think we think the big focus coming from China, US and Europe and, and back to the electric vehicle, sustainable infrastructure. But there's something that's visible in our, in our spectrum. We can see the demand picking up. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you do think that like it's mainly infrastructure that you're seeing in uh, Europe and U US? Correct. Right now, right now, China is old since March this year. They've announced a lot of infrastructure projects, and I think that's been the needle mover for copper this year. And you can see in how much important uh, copper they've done, they've, they've done this year. Also, scrap. If you take a look at the scrap markets and the prices are extreme lows, it tells you how tight the, the, the scrap market is in Asia, and that's made the copper price a lot more uh, uh, compelling as well. But if you have the, if Biden comes in next year and he starts talking about infrastructure spend, then that's going to be another wave of infrastructure spending that's not even being accounted by the market. So you have a few sort of triggers that can take the copper price higher um, and I think that's important but right now China has been the biggest driver of copper more than 40% of it effectively yeah okay so um, yeah that's uh, real interesting um, if you uh, let's see um, do you like have a strong view on the dollar or not really uh, the dollar yes we do we have to so right now dollars the, the part of the dollar is down central banks around the world cannot afford a stronger dollar if you get a scenario where the world goes through a, a third wave or a fourth wave, or you have economic uncertainty, as we saw a few months ago, the dollar is the first currency that rises, right? So every time you get an uncertainty, the dollar can squeeze and the whole world is very short. So you get these short bursts. And when you get a short burst of dollar squeeze, you will see commodities go lower. And I think that's a risk to copper as well. So we are on a thematic basis, we are very bearish dollar because the world is printing more and more dollars and we're going to a central bank digital currency. So that does not change. But if there's any sort of a geopolitical or exogenous shock that happens in the system, you have to be aware that the squeeze in the dollar can be very harsh. The one risk we had back in 2018 and 19 was central bank policy, right? The central banks, the Fed power wanted to raise rates at that time and the market sort of crashed really hard. We don't think that's a risk anymore. They're not going to raise rates. They're not even going to think about, think about raising rates effectively for the next two or three years. I think the central bank, especially the US Federal Reserve is going to run a Goldilocks economy for a little while where they let growth come back to Q1, Q2, Q4. We might be in a period where we have high growth, low inflation. They'll, run, they'll let it run really hot, and then they might think about normalizing the balance sheet. So we're not in the situation where we think central banks normalize the balance sheet or tighten rates. Not right now, it's too early. So that risk that we had early this year, given the, Fed, you know, the, the comments they're making right now, that's, we don't think it's gonna happen. So we are sort of genetically bearish dollar. Uh, will we actually put a new short on right now? Not, we don't trade the dollar per se, but as long as the dollar is weak and stays lower for longer, the, the commodity markets play out their eventual fundamental themes. Right, and that's um, like if I understand you correctly, uh, there you see some asymmetry in the markets because you really think this Powell put or maybe even Powell push is really there and will be here for a while and he'll sacrifice the dollar um if it ha if he has to right now right now the dollar is the world's they are the world's largest reserve bank right so the he's a cent powell is the central bank chairperson for the entire world if they raise rates or they normalize the balance sheet you're going to get a collapse in emerging markets there's the dollar debt bubble effectively right there were talks about what it was 32 trillion effectively the dollar bomb would go off uh, emerging markets cannot afford to pay higher uh interest costs on their debt so the, that's not going to happen they cannot let that happen yeah. What can happen, and the Federal Reserve is hoping for this, is they're hoping that eventually they pump so much money in the system that you get the growth. If you put money and you stimulate growth, growth gets to a point where it's three and a half percent GDP, then they can start raising rates. But what if you look at QE1 and QE2, we've been stimulating and stimulating, but we've not been getting the right growth. So every year we actually have to print more and more money. And this is a very academic debate, but the Federal Reserve really does not know what else to do besides printing more. So they're hoping that you get enough growth and inflation so they can raise rates. But my, my issue is this is something that probably is a bit contentious. We think there's inflation is going to happen. We might even have hyperinflation. We might have stagflation. Uh, we're not convinced yet that we get massive growth. So when you have a 
issue where you, it's like an old car. You put so much oil into it, you put so much work into it, it just can't move anymore. The car's gotten very tired. So we think inflation is going to happen because they keep pumping it in, but we don't think the car's going to keep moving much forward until something happens. So inflation is a certainty. Is growth a certainty? We don't think so. And that's why this view of stagflation and, and, and inflation is very important for our view. But the Federal Reserve cannot afford to raise rates or normalize till growth gets to you know, normalize growth effectively. Uh, and they're hoping this is just an experiment on their part because the last 10 years have taught them that they have to get inflation and growth and, and boost the economy. Okay, so that's almost like an argument for some of those tech stocks to still uh, keep some of them. Correct, uh, absolutely. I, I, we trade text in, in our fund because obviously we run futures against our positions. So I have to have a view of text as well from an asset allocation point of view. Every sector we look at, for instance, I have to talk about financial energy a lot because the growth value rotation is very important. So when I'm long my equity stocks on the energy side, this macro rotation plays a role as to the timing of this long short course. So I need to understand what is the valuation of financials, how do they stand out versus you know, technology. And I think technologies are still seeing, the large cap stocks are seeing 25, 30% earnings growth. It's not over. People look at real yields and yields are lower and the technology gets to be a buy. But these companies, the AI, uh, uh, cloud computing, disruption technologies, we're not, we're not done by that. And they have great cash in the balance sheet. So I do think we're in a scenario where large cap technology stocks will still start performing. And I think they've been underperforming for the last few months but we're not over from seeing another sort of burst to the upside because the, the fundamentals are very strong. Where in the market are you going to get 30% EPS growth? Yes, valuations are a bit high, but then again, it, this is not like 2000 in the bubble. It's been a paradigm shift. So we like some technology stocks as well and we are sort of having exposure to them through our futures positions. Cool. So yeah, this is um, this, this what's so, been so difficult, so difficult about this market. I've been way too bearish and um, it's so good to learn more, uh, more about macro from, from you. Uh, I'm going to let you go so uh, because you, you've been incredibly gracious with your time and uh, uh, teaching me so much and our listeners, I hope. Um, if people want to connect with you or uh, check out your research, um, where should they go? Okay, so if you go on, uh, we actually started a, uh, this year we launched a new service called MBCC Trading Highlights. Uh, it's a one stop Top shop daily for uh, high net worth individuals, sophisticated traders. It's, it costs uh, $99 a month and it's a minimum three month subscription. And it tells you exactly what the trade is. Like, for instance, like I said, sell side never tells you what to do. We sort of tell you every day gold buys uh, daily and it's been great. It's been very popular with the retail traders because they'd rather pay a thousand bucks and get access to in, you know, intellectual value added analysis then uh, go and you know pay Goldman's or Chris or something of that sort. So the, uh, people can contact me, us on infertmarticana.com and uh, we can put you in touch. So that's been a really good product. Whereas we also have, um, then obviously we advise hedge funds and that's much more on a much more long-term basis. But you can check out the website at mbcommodicana.com and has all the information there. Cool. Um, and on Twitter, we're very active there as well. Oh, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, Maliha oh. at MBCC. Okay, it's, I'll also uh, put it in the show notes. But, uh, uh, and then um, one last thing. In, on my end, you disappeared a little bit into the void just as you were saying the address of your website. Can you repeat it one more time? Uh, www.mbcommodicorner.com and you can find all the information and get in touch with us and subscribe to us and we'll um, hook you up with the research if you sign up. There's also a blog which we update on a you know, random basis, but it's more thematic, but the real juice is in the uh, trading highlights. Uh, like I said, it costs $99 a month and it's a minimum three month subscription and it just gives you a one-stop shop on physical market analysis, macro and bottoms up and gives you themes and ideas. Well, that sounds uh, super exciting. Thank you so much for uh, being on the show and uh, for helping us out. Uh, thank you and uh, see you next time. Have a lovely day. Thank you, man. Take care. Talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.